everyone, welcome back to Jump On Air. We're so happy you've chosen to spend a bit of your Monday with us as we explore statistics, science, data, and of course, Jump. My name is Julian Paris. I am the Learning Strategy Manager here at Jump Software. And at all, as always, I get the privilege of being your host for Jump On Air. And it's a very special Jump On Air episode today because today is May the 4th. <laughs> Now, before you go suing me, John Williams and Disney, that is me on the synthesizer, and that is a Creative Commons licensed graphic that was on Wikipedia. So, happy May the 4th, or May the 4th be with you. We're so happy you've chosen to join us for this very special show about science, space, and all things intersecting with Star Wars. And we really do have a really excellent show for you. I'm going to show this schedule throughout the day and talk us through all the transitions, but I'm really excited for the speakers we have. We have Richard Wiseman to talk about his new book, Moonshot. Uh, we're going to hear about Star Wars and data science. We're going to hear about Perseverance and the Mars rover, uh, planning your Star Wars experience at Disneyland, how to find an actual Tatooine, and then a special May the 4th edition of the tip of the day where Pete is going to buy a spaceship. So I'm so excited about this show. But before we get started on that, I always like to do a little segment. And I always like to remind you before I get to that point, jump.com slash jump on air is the link to remember when you uh, disconnect and want to come back. So make sure you remember that. And then of course, community.jump.com slash jump on air, the link to interact with all of our show segments and leave comments, feedback, or get any of the data that we mention. All right, so I always do like to start with a little bit of a segment, and I'm going to do another Asked Nobody statistical insights you didn't ask for, and this is going to be a very special May the 4th version of Asked Nobody. And to do that, I'm going to have to take you on a little bit of a journey to get to the data we're going to talk about. That is, a long time ago in a city far, far away, the SAS headquarters is where our journey is going to start. So here is the SAS headquarters. This is actually building A. This is where Jump is housed. And I probably have a dozen of this kind of picture because I, whenever I get to campus, I like to take photos of our building because I'm kind of weird like that. Recently, until we started working from home, I was getting to campus a little bit earlier each day. And partially this was great because I could get to see the beautiful sunrise over building A, and there were some really amazing ones. Uh, but mostly it was great because I actually got to park in the best parking space in all of building A, at least from my point of view, which is the one right next to the reserve spaces that's next to the stairway that I take up to my office. Now, this isn't going to be a talk about data on parking spaces, so there's a little bit of a twist here. It's actually about my license plate. So my license plate is data, and I'm not the only one with a custom plate at SAS. There is actually a stats license plate. There's mixed model. There's code poet. That's one of the ones I like the most. Uh, not every license plate at SAS is about data, but sometimes it's just about things people love. Okay, so I do love data. And a lot of you who knew that I had this license plate thought that it was only because I love data as in numbers and values in a data table. But it actually had two meanings for me. And I, of course, used it you know, and loved it because of the statistical reference, uh, but also because of Star Trek. And I know this is May the 4th, and so maybe it's uncouth to talk about Star Trek right now. Uh, but I have loved data from Star Trek, that is the android in Star Trek, since I was very young. And I can prove it. I actually have an essay I wrote from the fourth grade. If you can't read that, it says, a person I admire, data, as there always is with things I show you from my childhood. There's a lot to unpack here, but I want to zoom into a section and just read you a little quote. I admire data because of his intellectual level. He is smart and perfectly equipped to be a crew member. He really is. He can remember conversations word for word forever. He cannot age or get illnesses. He is almost indestructible. So all very true things about my favorite character in Star Trek The Next Generation. Okay, so twist. I'm not actually going to talk about just data, and I'm not going to talk about a license plate. I did have the thought over the weekend of how this android from one of my favorite space-based series compares to another favorite android in the one we're talking about today in Star Wars. So how does data compare to C-3PO? And I thought 
the best way to do this is let's dig into actually the script. So now I'm not going to go into detail uh, in the text analytics like Mary's going to later, but I did want to dig into how these two characters compared. So what I did is I made a data set. Uh, I went and got actually every line that was said in all of Star Trek The Next Generation and every line in the original three Star Wars movies. So 71,011 rows here. And I built out some features, so number of sentences, number of characters in each utterance, number of words, average word length. So some of these have formulas that you may want to look into if you're doing this with your own data. Uh, but we can do a lot of fun things with this if we want to compare C-3PO and my favorite character data. Okay, let's just start off with some basic things. So I'm going to go to Graph Builder. And what I'd like to do here is start by looking at, uh, just as a function of universe, some characteristics here. And... You'll see first that Star Trek The Next Generation has just a lot more lines set in it. It's just a much more expansive universe than the original Star Wars. And you can't fault them for that. This was a series that ran for seven seasons, and there's just a lot, a lot in there in terms of hours. But let's actually start with uh, a feature that I created that I liked a lot, which is average word length. And so if I put average word length in here, and let's go back to the bars. So now we're looking at the mean average word length for people who speak in this series. And one thing you'll notice, which maybe is not too surprising, is that Star Trek The Next Generation uh, tends to have characters who, and actually Picard's the most representative, tends to have characters that uh, speak in longer words than Star Wars. And that's not a dig on any universe, it's just a feature of these data. Uh, we could do a hypothesis test here, it's actually not really a necessary hypothesis test. This is the entire population of those two things, so just being able to show the mean difference is enough to show that they're really different. All right, so let's break this down a bit more, because now we're looking at across all the characters, and I want to look at this now across, uh, let's say, the different characters and their utterances. Now if I put all of the different speakers or all the different characters in the universe is there. There's just too much data. Even as a packed bar chart, you know, one of my favorite things that Zan came up with, it's still not enough because there's just so many characters here. So what I did, what I, did uh, I built another feature, which is uh, whether they're a top 19 character. And all that means is, are they a character who spoke within their universe, uh, sort of the top 19th most words? And so if I limit it by that, now we're looking at just those characters who really are, are highly represented within the different canons. And so we'll see things like the computer voice or the red leader or Q. To make this especially clear, I'm just going to right click and order by and look at these at average word length descending. And uh, just to make it clear which canon we're talking about, I'm going to grab universe and I'll color that. And I like this view uh, quite a bit more. So. As far as anyone in the Star Trek universe, the computer is actually the one that uses the longest words, which kind of makes sense. It is a computer, so it should be the most erudite of all of them. Uh, and then among the top 19th characters, the lowest here is Jabba the Hutt. Okay. But where are Data and C-3PO? Well, Data's right here. He's actually the second most long word using character, and that kind of makes sense because he's an android. But where does C-3PO rate among Star Wars characters? He's actually also the second most uh, long word using. So that's kind of interesting. So let's actually dig into just these two characters. So data and C-3PO there. Uh, I'm going to build a feature on the fly here. I'm going to go to the rows menu. I'm going to name the selection and column. And so this is just data and C-3PO. And I'll say uh, selected is yes, unselected is no. I'll take out that capital E because I can't have that. And so now I built a feature. I can go back and filter just based on that. So data and C3PO. And I'll do yes here. All right. So there's are just those two characters. So if we're looking, data definitely is, you know, speaking in longer words than C3PO. And that's probably okay. Data is from a universe where they tend to use longer words. Um, but now let's actually dig into what they say. And I think that's probably a more interesting question than just the average thing that they do say. And so I'm going to go into Text Explorer. And let's uh, do this rather quickly. I'm going to take uh, the text of those characters. And I'm going to take Data and C3PO. We're going to use that in a second uh, actually to filter this. So I'm going to hit OK. And let's actually just start by looking at the overall word cloud. Uh, this is the entire universe here. But let's actually do a little local data filter. I'm going to use data and C3PO. Hit plus here. And I'll say, let's look at just those two. And let's look at, in the universe, Star Trek. And notice that this is now going to be all of data's 
utterances. I'm going to redo this analysis, and I'm doing this actually separate windows just because it's nice to see them side by side. And so for a small screen like mine, it's going to be easier. And so I'll do now the Star Wars universe. Hide these filters, and now we're looking at just the utterances in the word cloud here for, well, you can kind of guess, C-3PO on the right and Data on the left. You know, Data likes to say sir and captain a lot, and he talks to the commander and the doctor, and he believes things. Uh... C-3PO likes to say oh, R2 a lot and Sir and Master Luke, so it's pretty obvious differences. Um, but one thing that I enjoyed doing over the weekend was I did a little latent semantic analysis on these. And so I said, okay, let's use the top 100 terms for each of them. And so let's do latent semantic analysis on the left as well for data. I'll do top 100 terms. And the one thing that I really like to do whenever I do this is I like to look at the topics they tend to have. And so let's just do a, a rotated SVD. I'll do with five topics for data, and on the right, let's do the rotated SVD with five topics for C3PO. So these are the kinds of things that they talk about. Well, let's look at data first. Well, data tends to talk about numbers a lot, and that shows up really well as a topic. He's always asked to say something, and he's made fun of for how specific he is. He likes to talk about minutes, hours, seconds. He does that a lot. And then he talks about sensors and subspace and ships and vessels a lot and life forms. That all fits for data. What about for C-3PO? What's C-3PO's typical conversations. Well, the first topic is all about him calling things stupid. And that's pretty common, actually, if you think about C-3PO and whether things are good or done well or uh, whether they're done right. And then he talks about Luke and Leia, those kinds of things. So pretty clear distinction in sort of their conversational topic. So even though they're both androids, uh, data comes off a little more analytical than C-3PO. And if you know these, these two universes, you know that's probably uh, appropriate. C-3PO is seemed to be imbued with emotions, whereas it's a core defining feature of data that he doesn't have emotions. Although, honestly, he acts like he does sometimes. But those are uh, characteristic of his character, and I think that's really interesting. It shows up right here in the data. Now, just as a final thing, uh, if we were to do the LSA by the entire universe, which I think is a rather interesting thing to do, I'll just bring this up quickly. Uh, we do get sort of topics that, that largely pan out for what we imagine of these universes, Death Stars, Operational Shield Systems, if we're talking about Star Wars, and Star Trek talks about family and, you know, time and captain's log and that kind of thing. So a lot of fun things we can do with script data and things we can do to understand uh, our favorite characters within these different universes. So that was Star Wars and Star Trek scripts. I will, of course, make that data table available on the community. It's about 80 to 90 megabytes, uh, and I'll even show you how to, how to import those scripts later if you would like. But that'll be available for your own playing of these two universes. And that was Asked Nobody, some statistical insights you honestly didn't ask for. So thanks for being here for that. In our first segment, I'm really excited that we have Richard Wiseman here from the University of Hertfordshire, and he's going to be talking with Ian Milley about his new book, which is called Moonshot. Hi, Richard. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us and talk about your latest book. Pleasure. Pleasure to be here. So, Moonshot, uh, what landing a man on the moon teaches us about collaboration, creativity, and the mindset for success has received excellent reviews. And um, I'm just curious, what inspired you to write it? Well, like all my books, it started off as a bit of a, a chance conversation. So I was at a, a party and I went to the, uh, the kitchen and there was a friend of mine in there, a, a comedian and sort of space nut, as it were, a friend of mine called Helen Keane. And we got talking about the Apollo moon landings. And she's a huge sort of, uh, hugely enthusiastic about them. And it was coming up to the 50th anniversary. And we spoke, as everyone does, about all the technology that, that kind of came off of the, the moon landings. And then I asked this one question, which then changed my life for the next two years, which I said to her, has anyone written about the, the psychology, the kind of mental technology that came off of this, how we did this, this amazing thing? And she said, I don't think so but you should really talk uh, to the mission controllers, the small gr group of people that sat at the very heart of the Apollo moon landings. I said, well, that's great, but how would I you know, find them? And she said, you should speak to my friend Craig. And I said, oh, is, is he kind of a, a big shot in NASA? And she said, no, 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 he's a welder and he's in South Wales in, uh, in the UK, but he's a huge fanatic about the Apollo moon landings. He's befriended all of the mission controllers. So I got in touch with uh, Craig, 
He got in touch with the mission controllers. They said, we're very happy to be interviewed about this because it's the first time anyone's asked us these questions. And that's how I got to talk to them all. And they were amazing. You know, they're now in their, their late 70s, early 80s, but they're still extremely sharp. And these were the people that created history, did this absolutely amazing thing. So it was an honor to chat to them. So cool. Thank you for sharing that. So in the book, you cover eight psychological principles that you believe underpin the amazing achievement to put man on the moon. So how did you narrow down the takeaways from these eight principles? Well, so it's actually the book, can, can, compared to the other books, was uh, at the beginning, I couldn't figure out a way to do it. Because normally you, you take a topic and you talk about that topic. But here we have this big grand narrative. You know, we have the story of arguably humanity's greatest achievement. And how do you do that? Do you tell the story and then do you look at the, the psychology? And so what I decided to do was tell a little bit of the story in each chapter, then you pull up and you look at the lessons from that. And so that's why I wrote the first chapter. And then I looked at it and thought, it's great, but it doesn't feel very me. It doesn't feel very practical because these are engineering types and, and so on. And so what I wanted to do was then shift the focus in the latter part of each chapter to the take home messages for everyone. You know, we're probably not going to walk on the moon, but we want to achieve amazing things, either in the workplace or in our, our personal lives. And so the second part of the chapter is very practical. It's about things we can all do to achieve amazing things. And those learnings come directly from the very long interviews that I did uh, with, uh, with all the mission controllers. So I tell a bit of the story, pull up, then you get the practical exercises, then we move on to the next part of the story. And that, that turned out to be, I, I think, a, a kind of workable structure for the book. Absolutely. Well, so putting man on the moon was absolutely an outsized goal. And it was one that was hard for people to fathom, yet it inspired imaginations everywhere. So tell us about the science behind supersizing our goals. Well, we, well, we should start with that story, really, with Kennedy. Um, because he's in, in the, 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 America is losing the, the, the space race, basically. And the, the, the Soviets have put up uh, Sputnik, uh, the, uh, the satellite going around. And it, I looked at the Kennedy archives, and it's astonishing. You know, his, um, his scientific advisors come to him and say, well, we could put up a, a satellite as well. He says, go away and think bigger. So they come back, and they say, well, maybe we could build a space station. And he says, think bigger. And they come back and say, well, we could send a rocket to the moon. And he says, think bigger. And he goes, well, we could send a person to the moon. And then Kennedy adds this topper in the early 60s. He said, yes, do that by the end of the decade. And that is crazy. It is crazy. When you look at the uh, rocket launches at the time, they were lucky to get you know, a few feet off the ground. And here, you know, even now, today, uh, the space station about 250 miles away from the Earth. And you're going to travel to the moon with a person, and you're going to walk on the moon and come back again? This is madness. And so I think what really drove the whole thing forward was that astonishing vision of Kennedy's, that notion which is so exciting that once you've got it in your head, you can't get rid of it. It's full of passion and it's full of purpose. There's a reason to, to do it. And, and a lot of the mission control was really reflected on that, that this fired them up, that this was something they could do to make history and that they have. We're still talking about it 50 years later. So I think for, for most of us, it's, it's what's that passion? And one of the ways, one of the simple exercises I talk about is saying, imagine you're marooned on a desert island. You've got a stack of books. You're allowed to have a stack of books. But they've all got to be about one topic. What's the topic? Right. Now, when people think about that, the answer is normally their passion. And that's a very short cut to, to what you're passionate about. In terms of purpose, just thinking through how what you do helps other people gives you that sense of purpose. So some research carried out by my colleagues, uh, which was um, on supermarket checkouts, which is not the most you know, uh, rewarding of, of activities. But when you told the people who were working on those checkouts that the contact they had with their customers was sometimes the only contact that person has with anyone all day, it's an epidemic of, of loneliness, well, now that becomes meaningful. You can change somebody's day just by how you interact with them for that short period of time. So injecting passion, injecting purpose, I think is absolutely crucial to then give you the, the rocket fuel to kind of motivate you for these astonishing goals. 
Right. Well, I have to say, the way you um, start the book, it was a great hook, drew me right in. Yeah, thank you. So in chapter two, we meet this innovative engineer who saves the day with a brilliant mission plan. But he had great difficulty conveying his ideas to key decision makers. So um, what barriers to innovation did he overcome? This is John Holbert. And, and yeah. you have to realize that um, the original NASA plan, which, which is looking back kind of hilarious, is to send a big space rocket to the moon reverse park it using technology we haven't even got now. Then somehow all the US astronauts get back into the space rocket, it comes back to the Earth, and you reverse park it again using technology you still haven't got. And that was NASA's plan in part because it was growing out of missiles during the war and they were going directly from A to B, so that seemed like a sensible thing, they knew how to do that. And also from sci-fi comics. So sci-fi comics were drawing big rockets going directly to the moon, and so the scientists looked at it and went, well, that seems like a reasonable plan. It was madness. That wasn't going to get you anywhere. And John Halbert has this fantastic idea, which is you break down the, the stages of the landing, essentially, and you create a craft for each of them. You create a craft that, yes, gets you away from the Earth. Now, here's a big Saturn V rocket. Then a much smaller one that gets you to the moon. That's the command module. And an even smaller one that gets you down to the surface of the moon. That's the lander module an even smaller one that gets you back again, and then you come back to Earth. And it's got far more flexibility built into it. As we found out with Apollo 13, when things go wrong, that flexibility really mattered, it saved lives. And nobody wanted to hear this from, from Hulbert. You know, that was against the, the grain, it was against the way everyone was thinking. He battled and he battled and he battled. And really, it came down to the organization being rational and saying, and, and uh, uh, the lovely phrase, you know, let's the best idea win, regardless of whether it is your idea. We all love to think, well, I thought of it, or it came from my team, and so I'm going to hold on to it, like, you know, it's one of my other uh, possessions, and, and no matter what the evidence is, I'm not letting go of that idea. We need to just step back, not be egotists, and go, let the best idea win. So absolutely crucial to the success of it. Yes, yeah, such a great point, and thank goodness for people like him. Absolutely. And, and because he was using vice versa thinking, which I talk about all the time, which is that you basically see what everyone else is doing. And if you want to innovate, do the opposite, do the exact opposite to everyone else. And that will normally force you in quite an innovative place. So they were all thinking about a big single rocket. He thought about much, much smaller ones all the way along. And it turns out to be a, a, a brilliant idea. Right. That was my next question to ask you about vice versa thinking. So thank you for that. <laughs> so next, I want to talk about this fire that changed the culture at NASA. And um, it was failure. And you talk about that a lot in the book, which I think is so great because it still has such a negative um, stigma. But we need to embrace failure. Right. So how can we learn more from failure? I, I think this is the, the, the biggest learning uh, from from the whole of the, the program, really. and. Uh, when I spoke to the mission controllers, uh, some of them were on the desks the day of the fire. And even though they're in the late 70s and 80s, they broke down in tears. It, it was still the most traumatic event ever for them. Um, so so uh, for those who don't know the story, um, three astronauts go into a, a, a test command module, essentially. They're not going to take off or anything. Uh, unfortunately, a fire breaks out and the safety precautions are such they can't get out and they're, they're, they're killed. And some of the mission controllers walked away that day and they said, this is just too dangerous. The remaining ones developed a very resilient attitude. And they said, look, if we walk away, those three deaths were for nothing. Right. What we need to do is learn. And we need to learn in a really honest way. And so they had several meetings and they said what was happening was we had, we were so gung-ho about being successful, we were so driven that we forgot to speak up when we thought there was a problem. The kind of mindset had become that if you say there's a problem or that you've failed, well, that's, that's really a negative thing. And in fact, actually, it should be celebrated because we can all learn from that. And that's how you prevent really big failures. And so they became very open. You know, they would go to a bar after uh, every single day and they'd all talk very openly about what they failed at and, and how they could do things. And as a, 
author about self-development, Dale Carnegie is one of my favorite authors. He wrote How to Win Friends and Influence People and How to Stop Worrying and Start Living. And when I looked at Carnegie's life for a separate project, I realized that every single day he kept a phenomenal journal. And the journal on the cover of it says, damn stupid things I've done and what I'm going to do to stop it in the future. And every day he sat down and just thought of the one stupid comment he'd made or the one uh, decision he regretted and just thought about it for a few moments and said, this is what I can do to stop it happening in the future. And we need to embrace failure. We yes. need to be honest about it. We need to realize that probably, you know, success starts with failure because it means you're pushing yourself outside comfort zones. It's where innovation comes from. And if you have a culture which avoids it at all costs, you're going to run into big problems one way or another. You've got to try new things. You've got to try new things and, and you've got to be prepared to go look at this thing I've done. It's not very good. Right. Um, so, so during the lockdown um, here in the, the, the UK, uh, I, I thought I'd do an online course and I thought, I wonder what I want to learn. I decided um, to learn how to make pop-up books. You know, the kids' books, we open them and the stuff pops up. Yes. Boy, I'm not very good at it. It turns out <laughs> I'm falling at making pop-up cards. So I've been making them most nights, showing them to my friends on, um, uh, online and so on. And I, I, I'm enjoying the failure immensely. I hope it's going to lead to vast amounts of innovation. I can't quite see it yet. But it, it gets you into that mindset of going, you know what? It's fine not to be good at something. It's, it's how you learn. Yes. Such a good point. Thank you. Well, so to return home after the moonwalk, um, they had to improvise. Right? And Buzz Aldrin had to use a felt tip pin to fix a broken switch. Wow. Yes. <laughs> so tell us about the impact of improvisational thinking and how we can switch to more flexible ways of thinking. I, I love the story. I love it. It's not particularly well known, actually. So, so they land, um, they, go, they go out, they talk to the president, um, 500 million people watching live, biggest event ever, and they get back in. And on the way out, one of their big space backpacks has knocked the end of a switch. It turns out to be the switch you need uh, to press to arm the rockets to get you off the moon. Mm. And they wow. are branded for all of that technology, all of that preparedness. They're stranded. And in the lunar module, uh, they have no tools because they're trying to make it as light as possible so it needs to carry as, as little fuel as possible. And so that's it. It's, it's a tough workaround because they've got nothing and obviously uh, gloves on and so on. And then it's Buzz Aldrin brilliantly that remembers he has got a felt tip pen. He takes it out. He thinks maybe the end of that is about the right size. He pushes it in and he arms the rockets that gets them off the moon. Phenomenal. Uh, yes. and it happened later on in the, the missions as well, uh, not with Apollo 11, but at some point they had the, um, the moon rover, the car, essentially, and uh, one of the, the, the mudguards um, offenders came off, and then Mission Control said, if you take the laminated map that you've got and some gaffer tape, you can actually just make another fender and just glue it back on, and that allowed them then to drive across the moon. So how do we get to that? Well, I think what you do is get very used to doing things differently. And, and we are all creatures of habit. But actually, um, uh, there's quite a lot of research, some of it comes at my own university, University of Hertfordshire, that doing things differently uh, during the day then helps you with improvisational thinking. So if you watch different TV programs or you read books you wouldn't normally read or when the time is right, you go to restaurants you wouldn't normally go to or whatever it is, mm -hmm. those small things about doing things differently then feed through, such that when opportunities come along or when problems come along, you are a flexible thinker rather than um, a, a kind of fixed, rigid thinker. Right. So, um, you know, it's nice to see that, that research, which is relatively recent research, being reflected all those years ago in the Apollo missions. Cool. I'm going to try some pop-up books. <laughs> oh, you should. Yes, everyone should. And what I will also guarantee is that anyone trying it will be better than me. Uh, but, um, yeah. <laughs> And you can send them to your friends, which I've been doing, and they don't remain your friends very long. So I, I need to get a constant supply of new friends so I can send pop-up cards to. <laughs> Hilarious. So um, I have a couple more questions for you. So how can the eight psychological principles that you outline in the book help us to cope with this COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, it's, it's tricky, isn't it? I, I think the two I would really focus on. Um, one is that I think what Apollo 
does more than anything else I've been involved in, it gives me hope. Because, it, yes, we put two people uh, on the moon, but there were 400,000 people working on Apollo 11 uh, across America. They came together with a single goal, and they made that seemingly impossible goal happen. And so when we're facing something as we are, which is, you know, this worldwide pandemic, I have hope that if we come together, then we will be able to do something about it. So I think that's the first um, big learning. The second one is that there were six words that the mission controllers essentially lived by in the workplace. And they were, it won't fail because of me. I will take personal responsibility to do my bit and if everyone does their bit, it won't fail. So when it comes to social distancing or whatever needs to be done, just that thing of taking personal responsibility, it won't fail because of me, I, I think is a, a very productive mindset. Totally agree. And I have to say, I have so much gratitude for the scientists and engineers that do the research, like you do research, and that it can give us hope because it, at some point we have breakthroughs. So uh, Yeah, absolutely. And also bravery. I mean, you know, to get, to get on top of a Saturn V rocket, it's, that requires uh, a little bit of bravery. And right now we've got some very brave people working at the front line there. Um, who yes. forward. So, yeah, it's, I, I think there are parallels there. Yes, absolutely. So um, one more question. So you did a recent BBC article and like at the headline, right? Coronavirus laughter in a crisis can help you cope, says expert. So please tell us about how laughter can help us now. I think it can. I mean, laughter and humor can be a double-edged sword, so you have to make certain you're not doing anything that's going to offend people or bullying or anything like that. But a lot of research showing that laughter bonds us together. Mm -hmm. um, good at the moment. We need to be doing that. And also, it's a great way of relieving stress. When you look at yes. people who find the funny in stressful situations, they're healthier psychologically and, and physically, uh, physically as well. So I think finding the funny as long as it's not offensive or, or um, upsetting to anyone i think is a, a really good thing to be doing um right. and if you want to find the funny make a pop-up card tonight show it to your friends and you'll all be finding the funny in that yes i'm gonna do that <laughs> <laughs> well i remember when you told me you were going to start research for the book so thank you so much for doing it it's a great read it's a lovely blend of history and psychology and i have really enjoyed it Oh, well, th thank you for your kind words. It was an honor to, to, to put it together and work with so many amazing people. And, and yeah, yes. I'm very glad you enjoyed it. So Inspiring. I'm so glad you caught that history before it was too late. Thank you. Thank you for your time and take care. And Julian, thank you. Julian, back to you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Professor Weissman, and thanks so much, Anne. That was a really, really interesting interview. Again, make sure you visit our community. We'll have the segment page built out if you have additional questions or if you'd like to comment on anything you see here today. I'm really excited about our next speaker. Mary Osborne is actually part of SAS's Social Innovation and Data for Good team. And she's here to talk about unstructured data analysis, which she's an expert in. And she's going to take us through movie scripts from the original Star Wars trilogy. Mary? Thanks, Jillian. I'm going to share my screen. And I am presenting from the deck of the Star Destroyer. <laughs> I love Star Wars. Um, so anytime I have an opportunity to do something Star Wars related, I'm all in. Uh, the first time I gave this presentation to a crowd was at a SAS Global Forum. And I, I flew in to that Global Forum the day of the presentation. And my intention was to change into my Princess Leia costume when I got there. But at five o'clock in the morning, as I was doing my cinnamon buns, I realized the dress wasn't going to go on over the hair. So I had to wear the Princess Leia get up to the airport. And that's always a fun experience. I mean, airports are fun anyway, but um, d being dressed up as Princess Leia, I, <laughs> I got all sorts of interesting questions like, which religion do I follow? And I said I was an avid follower of the force. Um, the guys at security looked at me and said, what are we really doing here? And I said, I'm on a diplomatic, diplomatic mission to Alderaan, duh. Um, <laughs> so all that being said, uh, this presentation centers around the capabilities that you can use to transform data into something that you can analyze, um, unstructured data specifically, and also just some rudimentary uh, text analysis. 
So to get started, uh, first a truth. <laughs> this, is, this is hotly debated in the Star Wars universe, but the reality is Han didn't shoot first. Greedo never actually had a chance. Han just shot. So anyway, <laughs> um, I call this one understanding the ways of the force. In my world, uh, my world tends to revolve around unstructured data. And the biggest challenges typically are the collection process and then the data preparation. Um, sometimes that can take, actually, in many cases, it, that takes longer than the actual analysis, uh, to be quite honest with you. So the process that we're going to discuss here will be data collection, data preparation, interactive discovery, scoring, and then you visualize that output. Because at the end of the day, you have to have a way to convey what you've um, analyzed out to the masses. So this is what the data looks like to start. This is what a Star Wars script looks like. This is probably something that Julian uh, ran into when he was doing some of his work. Um, basically, it's a wall of text. And that wall of text has some information about what's happening, like location with interior, for example, um, in all uppercase. So the Data Jedi's discipline, um, in my case, was SAS Data Integration Studio. And we didn't use it to its fullest capabilities. Basically, it was just a method to, uh, to work with the data. I like it because it's point and click. Um, it does give me the ability to edit data. Uh, it gives me the ability to manage the metadata. And then um, ha it does have um, some collaboration capabilities. So to go into it, what we needed to do to start was create a reference to the physical file, specify the delimiters and file parameters, and view the output. That's all the boring stuff. Um, what it ends up looking like is this. So we start pulling the data in, and it um, divides the, the data into lines. And that's how it starts building the actual data set. And we started with um, A New Hope, and we ended up doing the entire trilogy. And when I say we, um, there's not a mouse in my pocket. Um, it was uh, myself and my husband. My husband's a data guy, so I use him to do all the heavy lifting on a lot of my projects when it comes to the data side, <laughs> and then I get to do the fun stuff. Uh, so this, this is a lot of his work, uh, where basically we read the, again, we, um, mostly him, read the data in, uh, did some data manipulation, some extractions, created a table, and then saw what it looked like. And what we ended up with is this. Um, we ended up with a data set that just had a script line, and we did have it specify the source. So the source was the movie that it came from. So basically, if you look at that, that's, that is that first wall of text that I showed a few minutes ago. Um, at the end of the day, this is what the process ended up looking like. You have three script files feeding into an append, appending them together, and then, then loading them into a final table that we could analyze. So, my favorite part is the actual analysis. And uh, I love unstructured data. So any opportunity I have to play with unstructured data, um, I, I get my hands in it. Above all, the things that you need to keep in mind about unstructured data, um, it's a form of data a lot of people don't play that much with because it, it can be a little, it, it can feel a bit intimidating, but it's really not. I'm not a quant, I'm not a statistician, I just dabble. Um, so at the end of the day, Context is king. Jargon exists everywhere. And that is absolutely the truth in the Star Wars universe. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking about health and life sciences or retail, everybody has their own language that they speak. Um, and that complicates things. Uh, um, error is expected and accepted. It's hard to really say with 100% certainty uh, what your accuracy levels look like when you're dealing with text. Because somebody could say something like, wow, I love that product. And when we hear that, you understand that that's positive, that, that somebody actually really does love that product. Or somebody could go, oh, love that product. And it's pretty clear from the inflection that they probably don't, but you lose that when you flatten the data into pure text that you're gonna analyze. So you have to expect it with text data, you're gonna see some error um, and you accept it. Language does change over time. Um, the word sick is one of my favorites. Uh, sick has a lot of different contexts. When my kids say, dude, that's sick, that means it's good. When we talk about the current state of the world and people being sick, that's negative. So language, language and the way people use language changes over time. And geographic locale can have a significant impact. Here in the US, um, the arguments over pop, soda, Coke, 
Um, those are all hotly debated, uh, and it really depends on where you are as to what the data looks like. So what I like to play with a lot is SAS Visual Text Analytics. It's very similar, actually, to some of the things that uh, Julian showed in Jump. So there, are, uh, I think everything that I'm going to show you uh, in my screenshots, you can, you can do in Jump. When we first start looking at the data, um, something becomes apparent. And this is where you start looking at how things are regarded contextually. This is a list of terms and synonyms for the name Luke. And Luke in my data, just doing, just letting the software do its thing, it pulls out Luke as being a person, a location for some reason, an organization, which is odd, and a proper noun. So it looks at Luke in several different ways. And in order to really do our best with text analytics, we need to, uh, to fix that. We need to have Luke being regarded in one context, especially in terms of Star Wars. You know, if we're, if we're looking at something like social media, um, you may have a variety of different ways that you want to define something. Um, in, in terms of Star Wars, Luke, Luke is a proper noun. He's a person. So if we look at the way he's referenced in the script, um, people are uh, people will appear in uppercase, all uppercase, before their lines. So we've got a, a line here from Luke, followed by Ben. So nice conversation there. When we look at the raw data again, some of the other things that show up in uppercase are locations. And that's what you see here, locations and times. So you've got an exterior location, which is Hoff in the meteorite crater, on the snow plane, um, in the daytime. I'm not going to go into a lot of this. Again, this is my husband's domain, and it's a lot of code. <laughs> but essentially what it's doing is it's putting in additional rules to capture things like interior and exterior locations um, and characters. What we end up with is a table where we can start to, uh, further defining our synonyms and refining them. So we can take Luke as a proper noun or Luke as a person, and we can say those both tie to Luke Skywalker. Same thing with Master Luke and Master Skywalker, all tie to Luke Skywalker. And, and Luke Skywalker is a Jedi, so we can assign some additional rules. Han is Han Solo, and he's a smuggler. We've got the Wookiee, some rebels, um, Princess Leia. <laughs> and uh, Lando Calrissian, who I, um, I assigned him the, the parent role of scoundrel. Uh, when we look at it again, you can still see that there are some, um, you can see who's appearing, what their synonyms look like, uh, you can see how they're getting assigned. And this is where we started actually exploring the data. And the first exploration I did um, using something called a term map shows me how terms are related. And this is purely generated. So I don't have to do anything to get this. It just shows me the relationships between terms. And you can see that there's a relationship between Darth Vader and Lord, of course, because people call him Lord Vader. Uh, you can see a relationship ultimately to the Emperor and Luke Skywalker, which we would expect. Um, so often with things like text exploration, um, the cool thing is it can be very validating. So in this case, it was incredibly validating. And actually, in most of my screenshots, you'll see that it's validating. So we have a cluster here for Piet, who uh, rose to Admiral after um, Ozzel was uh, force choked by Darth Vader. Uh, and you can see Piet probably spent most of his time here on my Star Destroyer. Um, you can see his rise to Admiral in the data. You can see that he spent a lot of time on the bridge. So again, just, just a very quick and easy way, in this case, to validate what's going on in the data. We've got uh, fear and hatred. So we have the path to the dark side here. Uh, you've got, you have fear related to anger. Um, you've got hatred um, and slashing and all sorts of things going on there. So again, just another way to pull out some of the relationships. And then you had to, had to cover the force. So you've got the force connected to dark side. Um, strong, Jedi. So again, things that you would expect. And then finally, I like this one a lot because it sort of talks to the story um, where Luke is going to bring balance back to the Force, supposedly. We all know there's some question there. Um, <laughs> and there's also the word balance in a slightly different context um, where he and uh, Darth Vader are doing their famous lightsaber battle and he and the balance gets lost 
So there, there are a couple of different contexts you can look at, which is what makes text fun as well, is looking at the varieties of different types of context um, that are involved. Visual text analytics can do automatic topic extraction. So it can determine um, topics that you can then work with. And one of the topics that pops out is Darth Vader associated with Lord and Father and Emperor and Luke Skywalker. Um, it creates a word cloud and then you have the ability to explore the documents and how those terms are being used in context, which is what you see in that bottom screen. Um, from here, you can actually do automatic rule generation. Rules are interesting because you can take your own tribal knowledge, if you will, and um, specifically tailor rules to pull out data that you're interested in. So in this case, it's, it can automatically generate rules and then you have the ability to go in and further modify those rules. With Darth Vader, this is what a concept rule would look like. So this is, the, this is writing a linguistic rule that's looking for the word Darth, the words Darth Vader together, and the word Vader. So just a concept rule that's pulling out those particular terms. And then we can customize. And this is, this is where you can also, with, with data like this, you can have a little bit of fun. So I created custom categories and custom rules that looked for bad guys, good guys, systems, planetary systems, uh, the dark side, the force, and weapons. And then I had rules that pulled out those specific people um, or places or things. So I have bounty hunters, for example. And it, for these, I used very simplistic rules because there, when it came to the bounty hunters, there wasn't a lot of additional context that was needed to pull that data out. So with rules, you can use purely linguistic rules that, that give you the ability to pull out things like sentence structure, um, specify subjects, verbs, and objects. Uh, you can look at the data more in context. What I did here were simple classifier rules. So these are keywords. So anytime I see Greedo, Boba Fett, IG-88, Bosk, or Dengar, um, those all get classified as bounty hunters. This is what I ended up with um, as, a, um, as, an, as a final table. It has a lot more data in it than the original script. So the original script we started out with was a huge wall of text that the only real delimiters, if you will, were spaces, carriage returns, things like that, um, as well as certain bits of data in all uppercase. So I was able to add um, a variable for source, which tells us which movie the, the lines came from added in a unique identifier, which was a script line number. Um, so we could delineate between, visual text analytics requires a unique key and that becomes our unique key. We, I was able to pull in location type and that covered both interior locations and exterior locations uh, and then specific locations. So with the interior, looking at the location of rebel base and the specific area in the rebel base in the top line is the medical center uh, and then getting even more descriptive, we get into recovery room. So in some cases, there was a nice long hierarchy that told us exactly where people were, um, where people were. In some of the data, um, in some of the, the markers, there was also a location period, day, like day or night, not much more specific than that. Uh, always a character mention in all uppercase. The actual script line, uh, the taxonomy play here with good guys, bad guys, planetary systems, weapons, etc. So basically, we move from one giant wall of text into something that has um, additional variables that we can play with. And that's actually what makes text analytics su such a strong um, form of analysis, uh, giving us the ability to add structured, unstructured data and let us look at it in significant amounts of detail. Um, really gives us gives us the opportunity to, to try to find more insights in that data. I used SAS Visual Analytics to uh, to visualize the output. So to take that structured table that that was created and figure out a way to make the data available to the masses. And I think during my original presentation of this, I talked about the fact that I have this really nice visualization tool that I used to make bar charts with. Uh, because you're going to see some bar charts. 
<laughs> so uh, for those of you that don't know much about visual analytics, uh, it is in memory. Uh, it's designed to be an approachable analytics tool. So perfect for somebody like me. Uh, again, I'm not a quant. I am a dabbler. So I like to play with data. And after 20 years or so, I understand a lot more about statistics than I did 20 years ago. Uh, but I'm st I still don't consider myself to be a statistician. It does give us the opportunity to manipulate data further if we need to, um, and it is integrated with all of the other um, SAS visual tools. So moving from visual text analytics to visual analytics is a really simple process. So here's one of my bar charts. <laughs> Um, what I wanted to do, very similar to what Julian showed earlier, was I wanted to look at a distribution of spoken lines. This is something that always interests me, um, and it didn't surprise me at all, but as a woman these days, working on the Data for Good team, looking at things like uh, equality, the thing that stuck out more to me than anything else, given my current job role, is the fact that Leia is the only woman that's represented here, uh, which is Kind of sad. Things are improving a little bit. There are more women in the Star Wars universe being <laughs> being touted. But uh, one of the things that that did pop out was the fact that Luke had more lines than everybody else. And it sort of makes sense. Um, and actually, now looking looking back at what Julian was showing with his data, it's interesting how few lines there actually are in the, in, in the original trilogy <laughs> for the Star Wars movies. Um, but Luke had more lines than everyone else. And if you think about Luke and his progression from A New Hope all the way through, um, in A New Hope, he was very whiny. So he, he whined about everything. Um, and I, 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 what I, one thing I noticed that I don't show in my screenshots was as the movies went on, his lines went down. So apparently he became a little bit more introspective, I'd like to think, um, and less whiny. So uh, Luke was followed by Han and 3PO, which is something that uh, Julian showed. This is uh, the frequency of location. So in VA, I have the ability to build on the fly hierarchies. Uh, and as those hierarchies are built, I can then um, dig into a little bit more detail. So what this is showing us is the hierarchy of Death Star. Um, it's showing that Death Star is an interior location. And if we look at the hierarchy, it shows us all of the aspects of the Death Star. So we've got the forward bay, the control room, conference room, and so forth. There's the garbage room. <laughs> And garbage room shows up with a lot of mentions because of the famous uh, garbage compactor scene. We can look at the frequency of the force versus the dark side. Um, when I first started doing this, I kind of, I don't know, I'm dressed up as Leia, but I'm kind of a dark side kind of person. <laughs> I was, I was thinking that maybe the dark side would get more mentioned than the force, but overall, not so much. The data shows that. Um, the force was mentioned significantly more often than the dark side. If we look at the weapons and what people talked about, of course, the Death Star is the most um, destructive weapon in the Star Wars universe, uh, planets, uh, destroying planets. But lightsabers were mentioned, blasters, uh, blasters crack me up because even, even when you read the script, um, it doesn't give you a real feel for how inaccurate the blasters really are. <laughs> And then the mentions of planetary systems, of course, with everything that happens with Alderaan. Alderaan has a lot of mentions. Endor, um, I don't know how many people love Ewoks, but I grew up with them, so I kind of like them. Uh, Hoth, Yavin, Bespin, and Dantooine uh, were all the top mentions as far as planetary systems go. VA also gives us the ability to generate word clouds. And in those word clouds, uh, you can look at the um, highest frequency terms. The cool thing about looking at word clouds is it can give you abil the ability to circle back and make sure your rules are firing appropriately. So this can be just another way you can explore the data and make sure you have all your ducks in a row and all of the things that you are um, that all, all your ducks in a row with, with the terms and the rules that you're building. So if you see a lot of overlap, you may want to look at building more synonyms. If you see, um, if you see things that you're not seeing in your original exploration, you can account for those as well. So besides the fact that Star Wars is cool, how does this actually apply to business? And what 
the big takeaways from this are, in most cases, the fact that data preparation is vital. Um, without data preparation, you've got nothing. And that's something that hits all of us. And I know there, people talk about the 80-20 rule where you spend 80% of your time actually working with the data, building out the data, and only 20% um, analyzing it. And that tends to be fairly standard in the projects that I work in. Um, I work in text analytics quite a bit. Mostly these days, it's with social media data. And some of the projects that I'm working on now with respect to text are looking at uh, building out gratitude dashboards um, in, the, in the wake of all the things that are happening with COVID-19. Um, we felt like it would be interesting to take a look at what is being said in social media that could be positive. Uh, we see a lot of the negative things on um, we're inundated with it on a regular basis so what i've been doing lately is prepping data um, scraping data and looking at what people are talking about that that is more of a positive aspect so are people talking about being grateful for any i, I have four kids um <laughs> i'm grateful that we're all healthy um School is hard. <laughs> so looking at things like that to see what people are talking about so we can capture it and hopefully share a different view of, um, of, of the world. Text is everywhere. Uh, all organizations have it. It's a matter of what, what people want to do with it. Very often when we talk about text, people tend to go to looking at sentiment and looking at what people are saying and, and what the feeling is behind it, which is actually what I'm doing with my gratitude dashboard. Um, but the, it, it can be more than just sentiment. Very often it's, it's about trying to figure out what that data is saying. Um, it could be um, survey. Surveys are something that, that I've also got a lot of experience working with. And there are situations where people will collect the structured survey data and they'll ask for the unstructured comments. And when I talk to them, they'll say, well, we're not doing anything with comments. Well, why not? And a lot of times it's because they feel like analyzing that is difficult or they will have somebody reading through those comments and trying to anecdotally sort of analyze them. And that's not very efficient because the challenge there is people have their own experiences and biases, and you bring that into the data when you have somebody just sitting down and reading. Um, I worked on a project with the um, Bureau of Labor Statistics where we were looking at OSHA reports. Can you imagine reading OSHA reports all day? Um, there, was, there was a time when people were reading those um, all day and, and manually categorizing them. With text analytics, you have the ability to build the taxonomies and have that data analyzed um, in a more automated fashion. So that way you don't have to read about all the terrible things that can happen to you on the job site. Uh, data, data Jedi are few and need to be appreciated, not stymied. Um, they need to be given the tools that, that uh, they require in order to get the job done so they can take advantage of the valuable asset that is data. At the end of the day, if you don't have a good strategy for sharing your results with the world, if it's just numbers and it's difficult to understand, all that does is complicates the life of the Data Jedi. Um, it devalues the, the work that they're doing. So you have to have a way to make those results available to people so they can take advantage of it. And that's pretty much it. Um, I'm Mary Osborne. May the fourth be with you. Julian? Thank you so much, Mary. I, I love all the points you make. And you're right, data Jedi's need a lot of help. So do data Siths at that point. So. Um, <laughs> I'm very happy you joined us. Uh, in our next segment, I'm really happy to have two engineers from NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Christo Kreikbaum and Iona Brocky, who are here to talk about uh, designing the systems on the Mars rover. And I hope I said your names correctly. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> you did. Thanks. Very excited to be here. Um, so my name is Iona Brocky and I'm here with Christo. We are both mechatronics engineers at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. Uh, and we're going to talk today about 
designing the, the next Mars rover. So uh, contrary to the name, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory doesn't actually do too much jet propulsion these days. Uh, what we do is robotic exploration of the solar system and beyond. So I'm sure you can guess who my favorite Star Wars character is. Uh, and so what you might be familiar with is our most recent rover, Curiosity, is currently on Mars. Uh, and you might think, oh yeah, there's Curiosity there, but that's actually uh, Curiosity's twin who will be launching in July of this year. This is the Mars 2020 rover, uh, and it just got its name. It's aptly named Perseverance. Uh, and so what Christo and I work on is the sampling system on the Perseverance rover. And so what you see here is an artist's animation of what the rover's sampling system is going to do. So again, this lo rover looks a lot like Curiosity, but it's got wheel upgrades and a brand new suite of different instruments and tools. And so you can see this uh, kind of dark metal structure in the top right of the front of the rover. That's our drill. Um, so it's a big rotary percussive drill, the same kind you might get at Home Depot if you wanted to drill into some cement in front of your house, but this one is specially made for Mars. And what we're gonna use this drill for um, is to go up to a rock that the science team thinks is interesting and kind of push against the rock and then use our, our rotation and percussion to drill a core of rock. Um, anything that the scientists might think give us clues about what Mars used to be like. So when we've drilled our hole, it's not quite that fast, but when we've drilled our hole, we can bring that drill bit and that sample back inside the body of the rover. Uh, and the sample's actually already inside of a sample tube and we've got a second robotic arm underneath the body of the rover that can pull that sample tube and that sample out uh, and bring it to a bunch of different stations. But these stations aren't actually looking too much at the sample itself. What they are looking at is, did we get a lot? Can we seal it nicely? Because the end goal of this sample is actually to bring it back to Earth uh, and take a look at it with all of the different tools that we have here. Um, no matter how great we are at uh, assessing a sample, no matter how great we are at packing all of these incredible tools onto these rovers, they're never going to compare to the, all of the laboratories that we have here on Earth. And so, like I said, Christo and I work on the, uh, the sampling subsystem. And so there's a bunch of different exciting objectives for the rover, but that is the one I'm going to focus on. Um, if you want to look up more about the rover, there's other really cool things like we've got a drone on it for the first time to take flying overhead shots of, of the area we're about to approach. There's microphones so we can listen to Mars. A lot of really exciting new tools, but we're going to focus on this drill. Um, and all across the subsystem, we are using Jump to analyze our data and make sure that we're designing things as effectively as we can. Um, so I'm going to talk about one element and then Chris is going to come on and talk about another. So go up to a rock, science things, that could be interesting, but Mars is pretty dusty. Everything largely looks red and rusty. Um, how do we know that it's definitely a new sample that's interesting and diverse from the sample that we took previously? Uh, well, one of the ways we do that is with our surface preparation tool. This is actually just a different drill bit that we load into the same drill, uh, and we make a nice flat patch below the kind of weathered outer layer of rock. We get under all that dust, any radiation that might have changed the outer layer of rock, and then we puff it clean with this gaseous dust removal tool, or GDRT. Um, it's just like a can of gas that you might use to clean off your keyboard. And what these tools do is expose the inside of the rock to our different instruments and our cameras. Some of the instruments are Pixel and Sherlock, like you can see here. So there's a picture of our drill bit and a picture of our gas can. And these are what are going to really let us decide if this is the location that we want to take a core sample of or not. So we're confident in our hardware design. We, we know that we can do a great job making these holes, but there's still this question of how much can we optimize our gas usage? Because we're only bringing that one tank of gas with us to Mars. There's, there's no redos, no refills. Um, we wanna make sure that we're using it as, as efficiently as possible. And so of course, this is one of the places where jump can come in. Um, so we kind of step through these different, uh, these different steps. We identify our desired response. Here you can see the, um, the drill bits made this nice round kind of five centimeter diameter patch. 
and then the gas has come in and you can still see there's a little bit of dust around the outside that's that pinkish color but in the middle it's exposed this great clear patch where you can see that this has a bunch of inclusions of different types of rocks and you can really identify the different grain structure and grain color which is what the science team is interested in so that's our desired response is that dust free area and then identify the parameters of interest bunch of those on the um, things like all right we can move our our whole arm around so we can have the nozzle of the gas tank at different heights and different angles and different level offsets from the center of that uh, that abraded patch we've got different rock types that we're trying to deal with different depths of the abrasion and there's a lot of noise inherent with working with rocks um, they're very hard to, to recreate all of the properties of rocks if you just try and make them yourself. So we do actually go outside and find big chunks of rock to drill into. But because we're working with something natural, there's a lot of noise inherent to that. Um, and so kind of trying to dig out the noise from, from the data from all of the noise is one of the, the big reasons that we use junk. So we use junk to create a test matrix. Um, in this particular test program, I was focusing on the main effects and the secondary interactions. There's some parts of using the abrading bit and the GDRT that really don't have anything to do with each other, so we could remove those secondary interactions. Um, and then we kind of started with the minimum or default number of runs and then looked again to see if we needed to add more. Uh, test programs are time and money intensive, as I'm sure everyone's well aware. So now we could go to a management and say, this is the test we'd like to run. This is the conclusion we're trying to draw, and this is why we need this amount of testing to get there. Um, we could prove, you know, but using the power that this is, we really have thought about it, we're not asking for too much, um, and it's really easy to defend because we step through this procedural approach. And I'm just going to show a couple uh, good examples from when Jump has pulled out conclusions that were not uh, intuitive to me. This is a picture of a very deep abrasion. So that bit has drilled pretty far into the rock and as a result, it's kicked up a bunch of dust around it. And so we said, well, there's a part of the, the turret, the, the rover with just a flat disc. What if we press that disc around the abrasion? It'll kind of flatten down that pile and it'll make it easier for the, the gas can to blow the, the dust out of the inside of the abrasion because there's less dust on the outside. That makes great sense. So we tried it and we got these pictures and said, yeah, that looks like it did a really good job. This conveniently sized disc is really flattening that, that dust pile. And then we looked at the actual data from our test program. And so what you see here is the depth of the abrasion on the left-hand side, ranging from four millimeters deep to 16 millimeters deep. We're mostly concerned with the 16 millimeter deep because it's harder to clean these deep abrasions. And then you can see your cleared area on the bottom. So obviously uh, further right is better. And then you can see whether or not we did that stamping motion, either no in blue or red in, uh, yeah, uh, yes in red. And so I thought looking at these pictures that this was working great. And even the cleared images I thought looked pretty good. But what we saw from the data is no, actually, every time you use the facility contact sensor, you clear significantly less area than when you don't. Um, and what we realized was, when you're compressing the dust, you're also kicking more dust into the, the hole. You're making it harder to push out because some of the dust is packed down. And that wasn't immediately intuitive to me based on just looking at the photos. Um, so that kind of clarity was really useful to see. Um, so like I said, we, we look at all sorts of different parts of this subsystem. Um, Christo is going to come on and talk a little bit about something more internal to the rover. This was about kind of drilling out on the arm uh, and he's going to discuss something related to the sample tube manipulations that we do using that secondary arm underneath the rover. All right. Thanks, Iona. Let me pull things up here. So as I mentioned, um, after we do this abrasion, we're going to go in and um, collect a core sample from, from a lot of these rocks. And uh, the core will be acquired into a, into a sample tube, maybe about the size of a test tube or so. And once we get the, the core in there, we want to seal it. Uh, hermetically, I put hermetically in quotes because it's not completely, completely airtight. There's a very small helium leak rate that we're allowing. 
Um, and that's because we want to keep any volatile compounds that could be in the sample from migrating out. These samples are, are going to be sitting on the surface for, for some number of years, and so we don't want to lose anything from the sample. And we also don't want anything new to, to, sleep, to seep in there, either while it's sitting on the surface or uh, when they're on, hopefully on their way back, back to Earth someday. And uh, one, one of the ways we ended up uh, solving this problem is by using a space filling design. So when, when Tom and Julian uh, first, first gave us a call, I sort of said, how, how can I, you know, about this uh, May the 4th, I said, how, how could we double down? And I said, ah, oh, we're talking about space. We'll do a, I'll talk about space filling designs. So space filling design, you typically use those for computer, uh, computer simulations because in the computer simulation, hopefully when you, when you run it a second time, you're going to get the same answer with the same amount of, with the same inputs. If you don't, you should probably go in and check your code, I suppose. Um, and so, uh, right with the typical D DOE, typical design of experiments, when you're doing physical experimentation, you want to spread out the range and hit all the corners of that box so you have, you know, as big a span as possible to try to see the signal. But again, in a computer design, uh, computer experiment, computer simulation experiment, uh, you probably have some, some nonlinear effects going on and there's really no noise in the, in the system from your um, simulation. And so th in this specific example, uh, this, this ceiling uh, example, um, in the Im image down here on the bottom, uh, there are three main components that make up the, the hermetic seal. We have the sample tube that's gonna have the core sample sitting in it, the, the yellow piece. And then there's a seal cup in, the, in this thing we call the ferrule. And the way the seal is activated is the blue ferrule is pushed into the gray seal cup and you can see that there's a tiny little tooth on the gray seal cup and the ferrule causes that tooth to, to shove in and smash out against the sample tube, uh, which is what causes this, uh, the, the, the seal. So in these images on the right, these are um, x-rays of a pre-activation seal and a post-activation seal. And if you squint, I don't know if it comes through on the zoom or not, but if you squint close enough, you can see that the, the uh, post-activated seal, uh, you can see a bulge in both the sample cup and maybe a little bit of the sample tube there. And so the, the, the main problem we have is that this seal performance, essentially how leaky the seal is, is highly dependent on uh, the line load. So how, how hard that tooth is pushing in to the, to the sample tube. But that's something that we can't really measure. That's a really tiny interface. We can't instrument it. We can't really measure it. But one way uh, we, could, we could sort of uh, estimate it is through finite element models. But these finite element models are very time consuming to run and the analysts were really getting tired of us asking them to run a new, a new simulation and a new simulation every, you know, every other day almost. So we had the idea to use a space filling design and create a surrogate model that we could run very quickly and hopefully get the same results. So this, this is what I'm going to kind of hop into here. So we knew some of the relevant factors from these previous uh, finite element runs. Um, So the first thing we wanted to do was go in and make, a, make our space filling design. So uh, again, I mentioned we knew that the wall thickness, how thick the, wall, uh, the walls of the sample tubes were, and the yield strength of both the, the tube material and the sample cup material were um, the primary factors in, in the line load. And so to make our design, right, we found a special purpose, space filling. You can even see the tooltip it gets whenever you hover over the space fillings as designed for computer simulation modeling. So that, that gives you right there. I always like to, to save my factors because I like to be lazy and, and not have to type them in. So I'm, I've got this table preloaded. I can preload it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and continue here. We talked with our analyst and, and determined that 15 was a number that uh, would allow them to, to not scream. And we thought that 15 would probably give us um, a decent uh, a decent result. And again, we could always go back and add more, augment this if we wanted to. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into the details of all the different options you have here. We just did the simple sphere packing. Got your design here. I'm going to make the table. And I always like to go look and make sure that everything's making sense. So I'm just going to do a quick scatter plot of, the, of these uh, factors here. And sure enough, everything's nicely spread out. 
And one thing you might say is, well, if this is supposed to be evenly covering the space, how come you've got two points here that are right next to one another in a couple of these spots? And the answer is, so if I highlight these two guys here, you can see that while in, the, in this first factor here, the two yield strength, they're about the same value. And the other factors, uh, in cup yield strength, they have highly uh, separated values. So that, that's why some of these might appear next to one another in one factor, but then they're spread out in the other factor. So we took these 15 runs. The analyst uh, ran the runs for us. And what we get back is a time history of as that ferrule is pushed in to the, 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 the seal cup, tube expands. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna put the line load over here. And the ferrule displacement is how far into the tube that, that ferrule is shoved. So as the, as the ferrule, right, so each, each line here is one of the 15 runs. So as that ferrule is shoved in, we can see for the different factors, we get different final values of line load, drastically different values of line load. So some of these end up around 250 and some of them are up near 500. And so with this, what we wanted to do was make a simpler version of the model that we could just come in and, and use the simulator, uh, sorry, the, yeah, use the profiler and jump to, to help us um, estimate the, the line load for a lot of these parts. So we, for that, we created a simple neural network model. So to do that, I'm gonna come in here to analyze predictive modeling, neural, and our response is line load. And we had the wall thickness, the tube yield, and the cup yield. And then there's kind of a fourth um, factor that we get for free just during the process of running the simulation. And there are two ways that we can express that. We can either have the tooth interference, how far that tooth is protruding into the tube, or how far the tube is expanded. And those are highly correlated with one another, but we end up using them for different, different reasons. So I'm gonna grab the, the tube, sorry, the tooth interference here as my factors. Um, there are different ways you can have uh, this platform do a validation. I, I, in this example, we chose to have it take three complete runs as the validation runs. And so I've already excluded those rows. So I'm gonna do excluded rows hold back. And I wanna come over here and type in a random seed so that I can come back to the, and get the same results later. You can leave it at zero if you're not really interested in that at the moment. And I'm just gonna leave the hidden nodes at three. So let me turn on the profiler. So, so first we can see that we've got a pretty good fit here, right? R squared, RMS errors are pretty, pretty low, comparable to one another. And I'm gonna turn on the profiler. expand this guy a little bit and so uh, again so this tooth interference is really the the big hitter which makes a lot of sense All right how far that tooth is sticking into the tube is going to have a huge effect on how much load right how leaky that that interface is going to be and again you can see some minor effects in the yield strengths and in the and how thick the wall tubes are so then what, what we did with this model is we would want to ask the question okay if i want to shoot for a line load of say you know, 300, uh, 300 in the line load, and I have a, have a fixed wall thickness and uh, a specific tube yield and a cup yield, I wanna be able to, to pick the ferrule and how far out that tooth has to uh, be pushed to target that line load. So the way I do, I'm gonna do that is um, the desirability functions and optimization. So again, I'm going to lock out the line load here and lock the tube yield and lock the cup yield. Oops. So let's say that you pull your tube out of the, you know, we have dozens and dozens of tubes. Say you've got a tube that's got a 0.712 wall thickness and the tube yield is 1000 and the cup yield is, I don't know, 950. So now the question is, right, I could, I could come over here and I could uh, play with this guy to, to target that. But I, again, I like to let the computer do the work for me. So I'm gonna come over here and set my desirability to match a target. And I want to match 320, let's say. And I'm gonna squeeze these limits in a little bit to get a nice tight peak to help the optimizer out a little bit, 300. 
All right, so now I've got this nice tight peak. Now I can come over and have it maximize desirability. All right, I'm right here at 320, which is my target. And that tells me that I want to have a radial tooth interference of this 0.14. So if I pop back to the slides for a second, that, that tells me that I need to match up the ferrule and the seal cup so that when the ferrule is shoved all the way into the, to the cup, the tooth will be shoved out into the tube wall by 0.14. So then I mentioned there was a second version of this line load model that we used where after the seal was activated, we would use, instead of radial tooth interference, we would be able to measure how much the tube is expanded. And we went through a similar process to create a, a second version of this surrogate model using that. Um, so these are just a couple uh, slides that went through just what I was talking about there. And just in a quick conclusion, uh, right, what Iona was talking about, design of experiments, right? Methodical approach allows you to separate the, the process of, of setting up and running your experiments from the actual results. You know, sometimes if you get too absorbed in, in trying to get a result, you just kind of let any spurious results take you, take you possibly down the wrong path. And of course, you can use power analysis in the DOE to, to help make sure that you really got a really better chance of finding a signal in the noise. Um, and then again, with the space filling designs I just talked about, you can really, you know, give your give your simulation team or your, your analysts a break from from having to run all these tedious simulations and create a surrogate model for these expensive simulations. And then hopefully they'll buy you a coffee or something. So that's that's all I had uh, to talk about now. Thanks. Thanks to Julian for having us uh, come talk to you guys. Fantastic. Thank you so much. That was such an interesting presentation. Uh, we'll definitely have your recording on our community page, community.jump.com slash jump on air. So if anyone wants to uh, watch that more in detail and try to replicate some of the things they're doing with their own data, we definitely invite you to. I'm really excited about our next speaker. We have Patrick Bilchin here from Perspecta, uh, who self-identifies as a data Jedi as well. So not a data Sith. Let me see if I can get it to stay up there. There we go. Uh, talking about planning your Disney Star Wars experience. Patrick? Thanks, Julian. Um, yes, yeah, so I really enjoyed, as an aerospace engineer, I really enjoyed the previous presentation. I have to admit, mine is far less consequential for science and discovery in the future of mankind. Um, when the folks from Jump reached out to me, I said, well, I have an idea for May the 4th. Because when you are a data nerd, um, everything gets data. And I said, okay, look, I'm planning a trip to Disney World, but I need to optimize the amount of time that I spend going between this ride and that ride. And I need to know the best time of day to go to each ride. And so what I'm going to show you is I'm going to take you through the process of how I did that. I'm going to show you a little bit about how the sausage is made. And... Um, and kind of show how I would produce the visualizations and the trade studies that I need to, to plan that trip. Now, I'm going to start. I need to give um, a little shout out here to this website, which is called Thrill Data. So Thrill Data is the website that maintains uh, this database of all the different uh, amusement park wait times by date, time, month, et cetera. And so I'm going to actually look at the new ride or new-ish ride from Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, which is called Millennium Falcon Smuggler's Run. So just to get started, here's my jump window. And um, what, what I'd like to do is, you know, as a data Jedi, one of the most painful things, you know, the part where you feel like you're in that garbage compactor room is when you do the data conditioning. Usually the analysis is pretty straightforward, it's pretty easy, but trying to get the data ready is usually a pain. And I'm just gonna show you some of the little features and tips um, that I figured out in the course of doing this. So first of all, if you come to the file window, one of the things you can do is they have this button that says import multiple files. And the thrill data uh, is shown right here. So they have, basically you can download a file for each month of the year. So here are all the files. Star Wars Galaxy's Edge opened in August of 2019. So you can see from the file size, it's actually a smaller file size. It opened on the 29th of August. And then, you know, for some reason, there's a little bit less data in March of this year. I'm not really sure why that file is a little smaller. Maybe we'll talk about that later. But uh, you start off with this display, you list all the files, stack all the files together and say import, boom. Okay, so that was pretty easy. There's 33,000 total rows. And what you see here is, you know, here's the ride, here's the date time field, and then the wait time. So 
you know, if we were doing this all day, we would import all of the rides and then we would, you know, do each ride, what time of day, how long does it take to get from ride A to ride B, but just for now, we're just going to do the one. Okay, so the next thing that I do is there's a date time column. I'm going to come in here and change this to a numeric column, and then I'm going to change it to a time column, and I think it's year, month, day, hours, minute, second. Okay, so now that goes from just a text column into a date time column. Then I want to make a column that is the hour of the day because I want to decide, you know, hey, here's the wait time by time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a new column. I'm going to call this column hour of day. And then I'm going to come over here and I'm going to go to a formula. Click formula, click edit formula. Then you get this box and you just say date time, hour, and then that column. Okay, there's that one. Hour of day. To improve the uh, graphing of this, if you click right here, I'm going to change that from a continuous to a nominal variable. Okay, so then I was like, I really need to know what day of the week it is. So I was going to go like day of week, and then I was going to pick one day, and I was going to like figure out what it was, then add one to the whole thing. I was like, you know, it's jump. So let's, before we do that, let's just go over here and go to formula, edit formula, and let's go look at the date time formulas that exist. Oh, look, of course they do. There's a formula called day of week. Day of week, date time goes right there. Okay. All right. Well, now we get day of week. All right. So it's a number, but I want it to be the actual day. So I could either recode this column or I could find replace, but I'm going to show off a little bit. We're going to open up a little tiny file that is the number of the date code. So here's the day of week. Here's the actual day it corresponds to. And then you come up here and say table, join, date codes. And then you just say day of week, day of week. Click those two, match those two. Merge the same name. No, I don't need one of those. And then you say, OK. And now I have this new file that was created that now has the day coded. OK, I'm going to do uh, one quick thing in here. If you come to the day and you come over to the column properties, one of the things you can do is you can change the order, this thing called value order. So the cut, the order goes in the same number as one through seven, but I think that it would be easier for me to understand if I put the weekends at the end. I'm pretty sure I don't wanna to go to Disney World on the weekends, but then I can see like weekdays and weekends, this means they'll now be plotted in that order. Okay, day of week, date codes, I think we're good. So now what I'm going to do, I'll do one more thing just to make the graph look a little prettier. Uh, if you come up here to rows, you can say color or mark by column, day. And now it's just going to give me different colors so that, I mean, it's Disney. So it's got to be like a little more exciting and colorful and magical. So now I can get the graphs by color. Then I don't know what version of Jump first introduced the graph builder, but it kind of changed the world for the better. So the graph builder is, I think, everyone's favorite. Uh, function. And so it's just super easy. It's totally idiot proof. It's like, here's what I want to do. I want to see it by day. So here are the counts of data by day. Okay. I actually want to see it by hour of day. So you put that over here to group it. And the thing that I want to see is wait time. <sighs> okay. So that's kind of a mess that, you know, it's, it's pretty, it's kind of a mess, but I don't know what it tells me. Well, the function that I want to do is I come over here and I click histogram. Whoa, there it is. Okay, so here's what you see. A distribution of wait times beginning at 6 a.m. Sometimes the park is open late. Um, sometimes it's open early. And you see a distribution of wait times, these little histograms for every day, every time. And what you're really looking for is you're looking for something like over here, Friday at 1800. You're looking for something that's like this. It's really spiky. Uh, and what that means is you, you, what you don't want, I'll show you what you don't want, is like up here, Thursday, first thing in the morning, there's a huge distribution of wait times all the way up to like four hours waiting in line. So um, you, you really want it to be in a tight distribution at different times a day. And this lets you look through and see, you know, for example, um, you know, if we look at like Thursday around dinner time, like actually this distribution even kind of looks like a star destroyer. That's pretty cool. But then, you know, it, it gives you what that variability looks like. So typically, 
it says there's a huge crush in the morning, like the thing where they do the magic hours where you get in early, you, I guess you have to run really, really fast as soon as the rope drops because you, everyone else just sort of stacks up in line before you can get the fast passes. And then it looks like there is some benefit in going around lunchtime. I guess people got to eat, so there's some benefit. And then typically if you wait till later in the day, the wait times get much lower. And so for me, I probably would pick like maybe this Thursday around 5 p.m. I would go for something like this. I might even go Friday evening. I might pick that one instead. But then, you know, obviously I'm just going to repeat this for every, um, every day, every time, every ride, every park. How fast do I walk? It's just going to be a more um, time consuming process. I'll show you one more example here. So that gave you the entire grid of those. And if, uh, if you use the distribution platform and come up here and say wait times, and you go by day. So now what you're getting is here are the different distributions for each day. So, you know, Monday, here's kind of that distribution, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you know, Thursday looks pretty good. I kind of like Thursday. And one of the other features I like is if you come in here, you can do, if you click this little red triangle, you can click this thing called local data filter. This is another one of these really cool features. So if you click hour of day, and say add. Now you can do a little trade study just by as you click on the hour, it will recalculate the distribution in real time. So what I like to do is go, okay. So, and really what I'm looking for is I'm looking right in here. Now, I don't really understand what a hundred minutes is. So I could come in here and say that's 360 in increments of 60 and say, okay, aha. So there's basically one hour, two hours, five hour wait time. Ugh, gosh, that's terrible. So what I'm really looking for is, for example, you come in here around 1500 and you start to see, hey, 49% of the wait times are less than an hour and then 54% and then 69%. So this is the behavior we can look at later in the day. So I think I'm going to target this ride. I'm going to lock this one in 1800 on Thursday and I'm going to plan my entire life around that. So anyways, that's basically, you know, when you're a data nerd, that's how you go through the process and you, you do a lot of, I mean, you could just wait in line and talk to your family and, you know, eat a snow cone and do things like that. But it's more fun to be able to say, hey, I've done all the data, I've done all the analysis. So we did do this. We have the whole trip plan. Uh, we're going next Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I've got all the flights, optimum flight, perfect seating. Uh, we've got all the hotels. I'm pretty sure we've thought of everything. There might be something that I'm missing, but so far it looks like everything's going according to plan. So anyways, uh, jump. May the force be with you. Thank you for the invite. And that's how you do analysis of your vacation using jump. Thank you so much, Patrick. That was really informative. Yeah, I wish you great luck on your trip next week. You may find your wait times are more towards zero. We'll see. Uh, in our next segment, I'm really excited that we have Professor J.J. Hermes here from Boston University. He's going to take us through a really interesting topic, which is how to find an actual Tatooine. J.J. Great, thanks. Let me go ahead and start sharing here. All right, super. So I thought it would be fun to actually talk uh, about how astronomers all over the world are looking for new alien worlds. And I want to motivate that by a discovery that was made uh, about 10 years ago now of a system of planets, um, at least one planet, that's orbiting two host stars. Uh, so this very famous sunset of uh, Luke Skywalker looking at two sunsets at the same time uh, on his home planet of Tatooine actually exists in space. And I want to talk about how astronomers know about uh, this and talk a little bit about um, where, where the frontiers are in finding new, new alien worlds, new exoplanets. So I'll start off with, with a really mind-bending thought from a galaxy very nearby, our own, uh, which is that by, by studying hundreds of thousands of stars by looking for planets around hundreds of thousands of stars. We know now that on average, every one of the more than 200 billion stars in our galaxy probably has at least one planet. So we don't know of all of these planets yet, but statistically speaking, uh, we know 
uh, what are the, the, what's the likelihood that, that that many planets exist? And so I'll sort of run through that today uh, at the end of, of this little presentation. Um, but all of this is enabled by uh, pretty expensive uh, space telescopes launched by, by NASA. And by far the most successful of those space telescopes is the Kepler mission. So Kepler uh, is, is a light bucket. So that's what telescopes are. Uh, they're big mirrors that amplify, magnify light. So they're really big light buckets. So Kepler launched uh, back in 1999, uh, 2009, I'm sorry. Uh, and it has a, a basically a meter aperture. So there are two humans to scale next to Kepler. It was launched by NASA. It was uh, built a lot by, by Ball Aerospace Engineers. So for scale, the Hubble Space Telescope, which many uh, of you have heard of, it's been in orbit now for, for 30 plus years. Its mirror is a little bit bigger at about 2.4 meters in diameter. Um, usually it, telescopes are, are measured in, in diameter. So Kepler's got a pretty big aperture though. It's, a, it's more than a meter in, in diameter. It's almost a meter in diameter. But it was launched with a huge camera, a 95 megapixel camera, which at the time was the largest unclassified camera uh, ever launched into space. Uh, and it was exceptionally good at looking for new worlds. Its main goal was to find new worlds. And the way it did that was by staring at hundreds of thousands of stars, looking for little dips in brightness caused as those planets pass in front of those stars. So this is exactly what astronomers are looking for when they look for new worlds. It's the easiest way to look for new exoplanets. Uh, and so it's a game that astronomers have been doing for only about 25 years, but are getting better and better uh, at this game. So this is the very first picture that Kepler took. Uh, this is the huge 100 square degree sky. So for reference, a full moon is about 0.2 square degrees. So this image is about 500 times bigger in area on the sky than a full moon. So this is a huge patch of sky. So there's lots and lots of stars on this, this image here. And uh, so what Kepler did was it tried to, to look at all of these stars and make a time-lapse movie of the brightness of all of these stars uninterrupted by sunrises, clouds, all the other muck that gets in the way on Earth. And so here is now an animation of what, uh, what Kepler looked at. This, this top right image here is an actual picture of the data collected from the Kepler Space Telescope. On the bottom right is what that star field would look like if you had a decent ground-based telescope. Uh, so we're zooming in on this one star right here. And down here in the bottom left is what the actual data looks like. Uh, so we're just measuring the brightness of this star with time. So every one of these yellow dots is a picture that was a 30 minute exposure of the brightness of this star and running on time to the right time and days. So this is about a month's worth of data. Uh, we're just counting photons. We're, we're counting up the light from this star, trying to figure out if there is a periodic dip as a planet passes in front of this star. So this is how Kepler looked for new planets. This is how astronomers look for new planets. But what was so revolutionary about Kepler and why uh, Bill Baruchi and a lot of people tried to get it launched for a really long time, uh, it took five attempts before Congress uh, and, and NASA finally allocated enough funding uh, to, to launch the space telescope uh, is because it was uninterrupted uh, data. So this data was, was from a space telescope uh, that was, uh, you know, uh, floating in space, taking data, uh, looking for new, looking for new worlds. So what Kepler was, was really after is to try to answer the question of how unique is the earth? Um, and so to find, to answer that question, we actually need to go out and find new earths. We need to find planets that orbit their host stars every 365 days. Uh, that are about the same size as Earth. And so when we have a planet pass in front of its host star, it takes out a little divot of light. So the brightness of that host star decreases. And if you want to find an Earth analog, a true Earth, uh, put another way, if you're an alien looking back at the sun and you want to detect the Earth, what you're looking for is an 84 part per million dip in sunlight that only happens for about 10 hours every year. 
So that's why you have to stare at a lot of stars for a really long time. Uh, you're looking for tiny little changes. Uh, and so the Earth would be blocking out 0.0084% of the sun's light for only 10 hours. And it would only do that once a year because that's the amount of time it takes Earth to orbit the sun. So Kepler stared at lots of stars and it found lots of planets. It found more than 4,000 good planet candidates. This is from an updated catalog released in 2018 going through the first four years of, of data from the Kepler mission. Um, but you can see there's this beautiful uh, trove of data. On the, the x-axis of this plot is the orbital period of the planet. Uh, so here's where the Earth would sit on this plot with a 365-day orbit. Uh, and we have planet candidates that look a lot like Earth. Uh, you notice it's harder and harder to find these small planets with really long periods. Um, but we found lots and lots of planets that are somewhere in between the Earth and Neptune in radius with orbital periods that are a few dozen days. Um, so we found lots and lots of planets with uh, Kepler. Uh, NASA actually has a second uh, follow-up mission. Its newest exoplanet mission that was launched uh, in 2018 is called TESS. Uh, it's a much smaller mission, the, the aperture. Uh, therefore, the light collecting uh, power is, is much smaller than Kepler, but it sees much larger area on the sky. So it's actually surveying even more stars, even brighter stars, so more nearby stars for, for new planets. And you can actually try to look through new test data yourself, even if you aren't a, a data junkie. I've heard a lot of people talk about uh, being uh, quants or not quants today. If you're not a quant, uh, this is a great data set to look through on a website called planethunters.org which is a citizen science resource where you can look uh, to try to classify and look for new planets. Uh, and uh, here's what that website looks like if you go to it. Uh, I'll plug it again at the end of this talk. It's all run by astronomers at Oxford University. Uh, and here is an example light curve. I teach a class uh, of introductory astronomy at Boston University. And I have my students who uh, are freshmen in college trying to find new worlds through this data set. And so if you look at this data set, uh, you will see occasionally uh, dips every few days. So this x-axis is time and days. This y-axis is the brightness of the star. So when the star is getting fainter, uh, it's going down on the y-axis. And so you can see here, every 4.4 days, this star is losing almost a percent of its brightness. And that's because there's an alien world passing in front of that planet. So I just trained you to find new worlds on this website. This is exactly how astronomers do it. Um, and uh, this website actually helps astronomers test some of the machine learning and other algorithms that we use to find new alien worlds. And so I'll give you another test, maybe by eye. Now you can see how we're doing this. Hopefully you see two big dips here to try to find uh, this new alien world in the test data. Uh, and so I'll, I'll mark it on this plot. That's how we find new worlds. Uh, so you've just now find, you've just been trained now to find alien worlds. Here, this planet is orbiting its host star every 12 and a half days. It's causing that host star to get about a percent fainter as that planet passes in front. Um, so that was another planet found from, from some students of mine uh, uh, just last year. Here's another. Let's see if you can see it in the data. Uh, this one's a lot more subtle, harder to see. Um, but pat yourself on the back if you found the planet there that's only dropping its starlight by 0.03%. Uh, this was actually found by a student in my class uh, last year going through this Planet Hunters website. So this website is updated every month with new data from NASA's test mission that's looking for planets. And so if you'd really like to go try to find some new worlds, you can go to planethunters.org and try to find some new Aldebarans or whatever your favorite uh, Star Wars planet was. So I promised to talk about Tatooine. And so in this huge Kepler data set, um, astronomers also found evidence for a real world, a real life type of Tatooine, uh, which is a planet orbiting two stars. And the name of this planet is Kepler 16b. So astronomers aren't super creative. Kepler was the name of the mission that found this new planet. It was the 16th planet 
found by Kepler. And every new planet around a star gets a name, lowercase b for the first planet, lowercase c for the second, and so on. So Kepler-16b was the first planet found around the uh, star uh, Kepler-16, which was the 16th star that, that showed a planet in Kepler. And we actually know this planet has about three quarters the radius of Jupiter, and it orbits two host stars every 229 days. That is, these two inner stars orbit each other every 41 days, and there's an outer planet that orbits every 229 days around those two inner stars. So this planet would have two sunsets. Um, this is a beautiful uh, travel poster for this potential alien world. Uh, and uh, it's great to think about your shadow always having company uh, in this land of two suns. So astronomers, humans now know of real world Tatooines. Uh, I wanna show you actually what that data looks like uh, to, to convince you uh, about how this, this works. Uh, it's a very simple experiment. You're just making a time-lapse movie of the brightness of that star. Every 30 minutes, you're measuring the brightness of that star. And if there were nothing exciting happening about that star, it would just uh, constantly be giving us a value of one. It would just be uh, flat. It would be constant. The brightness of that star would be constant. But you notice um, every 41 days, the star loses a lot of its brightness. That's as the smaller star, star B, passes in front of star A. It eclipses star A, so it blocks off a lot of light. Uh, that gives us these big blue dips. Those repeat every 41 days. Similarly, the big star passes in front of the little star. That repeats every 41 days. That's what these little yellow uh, features are in this light curve. And then every 229 days, uh, that's what this x-axis is, is time and days. Every 229 days, uh, the planet uh, passes in front of the bright star, star A. And so that's how we actually have evidence of, uh, of this system. So just by monitoring the brightness of stars, astronomers know now of, of real world Tatooines. Uh, this is not the first and only, uh, this was the first, but this is not the only star system where there's uh, two sunsets. We now know of, uh, of a dozen or more of these types of systems by looking uh, in space. Uh, so it's, it's really cool to, to think that science fiction is, is now science fact in a lot of ways uh, when astronomers can see these uh, transit events where we see a planet actually blocking off starlight. And in this case, this planet's blocking off starlight from uh, two stars that orbit each other. So it is possible to have a Tatooine-like world. Um, I want to finish here just with a plug for if you love data, if you want to get your hands on actual space-based planet data, um, NASA makes all of its data open source. As I said, there are thousands of planet candidates, um, but when we want to get to the, the statistics of knowing how many planets actually have, how many stars actually have planets, you need to factor in uh, the fact that not all planets are aligned in a way to block off light from their host star. So in this animation, you see a planet that's blocking off light from its host star, but that's uh, the, the orientation of planets on the sky is completely random. So lots of planets are gonna exist out there that don't block off light from their host star because they aren't oriented in such a way. So here's another system where those, there are at least three planets orbiting a host star, but they don't, orbit in the same plane that we're looking at that system. Uh, and so they don't block off light from their host stars. So we actually have to factor that in if we want to do statistics and understand uh, what is the ensemble of properties of, of planets outside of our solar system. And so we can do those statistics. We can, we can run those models. One of the ways we do that is we inject fake planets into data and see if we can actually recover those planets, it's kind of like a hare and hounds exercise where you do what's called injection and recovery, where we inject fake planets and, and make sure we can detect them. So that's what gives us these error bars, but this is the average number of planets that orbit uh, a star with orbital periods shorter than 300 days. And so you can see on average, if you add all of this up, this is a histogram of planet size, where Earth is, is one on this scale. On the top axis is sort of the sizes we have in our solar system. So we see there are Neptune analogs. There are a few Saturn and, and Jupiter analogs, but that's only um, 
you know, uh, about 5% of stars have Saturn or Jupiter analogs inside of 300 days. But what's really interesting is that when we, when we do the statistics, we see uh, there are sizes of planets, we call them super Earths or mini Neptunes, that fall in the gap that we have no planets like that in our solar system. So uh, these are Earth-sized planets, these are Neptune-sized planets, and most of the planets that we've found orbiting other stars have no analog in our solar system. So this is still a really interesting open problem is, is our solar system unique um, or uh, uh, is, it, is it more rare? Uh, are, are, what is the architecture of most solar systems? Uh, and, uh, and, and that's where doing these injection and recovery uh, efforts really help us understand these, these questions. So if you'd like to get your hands on this data, NASA's made it extremely accessible. Uh, you can find it on uh, the Exoplanet Archive. So if you, if you move your browser to exoplanetarchive.ipac.caltech.edu, and I'll put another uh, plug at the end uh, to, to that website, you can actually get your, your, your actual hands on the data. You can look at confirmed planets, planet candidates. Uh, you can look at uh, the the e equilibrium temperature of these planets. We want to know how many of these planets have liquid water on their surface. Uh, so how many of them have equilibrium temperatures that are similar to the Earth at about 250 Kelvin? Uh, so all of these questions are, are lurking in the data, uh, ready for you to, to have a look. So that's how astronomers have actually found actual Tatooines. And I want to, uh, to say, you know, anyone can do this. Uh, if you want to just quickly by eye look through the data, you can find it at planethunters.org. Uh, but if you actually want to go through some more robust statistical analysis, you can find it at exoplanetarchive.ipac.caltech.edu or just Google Exoplanet Archive NASA and you can find the data. So um, tattooings are out there and uh, yeah, I really appreciate your attention and, and thanks so much for, for letting me join this, uh, this seminar. Cheers. Thank you so much, JJ. Uh, we'll make sure to get those links and put them up on your segment page as well so people don't have to remember a long URL. But thank you so much. That was really informative, and, uh, and we're so happy you could join us. Thanks. Thanks. Our next segment, we have Pete and Mary back to do a very special May the 4th edition of the Tip of the Day, where Pete and Mary act out real-life problems that could be solved with a jump tip. today oh, i see you have a i'm lot of good i'm celebrating today. celebrating may the 4th uh-oh oh may Wait. the 4th uh-oh i got may caught <laughs> <laughs> i think you you know being a sword person myself i think you need a little practice obviously obviously yeah. my my daughter is teaching me how to be a better lightsaber fighter so yes all right all right next time i'll wear my little cloak you know <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Good idea. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, I, I had a couple of cool things to show. And um, it's not just in jump. I also figured out how to go to uh, Tatooine. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, you should have told me I would have dressed up like Princess Leia. <laughs> But um, <laughs> I I don't know, Mary. Did, did you, can you did that bikini might be <laughs> uh, anyway. Um, I can, <laughs> so Pete, I hear you want to now buy a spacecraft. Yeah, here. Let me show share my screen here. I, I've I've right. been I've been looking at uh, doing a couple. Uh, that oh. purchasing a spacecraft and I, I pulled this data from from Kaggle but then I added some cool things uh, in jump that you maybe knew about maybe didn't know about we, we talked about this a getting picture. a picture yeah. in but one other thing I can do is I can have this uh, event handler and this will just take me to the website about that specific oh. uh, yeah specific ship Oh, but, that's pretty neat. So you're getting ready for the zombie apocalypse now, or, you know, so you can escape and go off and why the world heals itself, you're up in space? That Exactly, <laughs> yeah. It, but I, I need to have room for my friends. So okay, please. I, I wanted it to not cost too much credits. I wanted yeah. my spaceship to um, go pretty fast. Uh -huh. And I, I wanted it to have room for a good amount of passengers. And I found this cool feature in Jump that allows me to find the best of all of those 
world. And oh. it's under row, row selection, and select dominant. dominant. Okay. okay. Yeah. So I'm going to pick the three that I care about, and I could pick as many as I want, but cost mm -hmm. and credit, mm -hmm. my max atmosphere being speed and the number of passengers, and I hit OK. And I want to maximize uh, speed and passengers, but minimize credit. So I just uncheck that, uh -huh. hit OK, and now Jump has selected the seven best spaceships that make up that Pareto front. And what that means is it's either the cheapest or the fastest or carries the most passengers. Um, and if I move off of that spaceship, I sacrifice something. So like this solar sailor, yeah. this is right in, in the right budget for me. It carries 11 people. So I might have to make some cuts on which friends get to escape with me, but it goes pretty fast too. Um, oh, I like that. I want to feel that my cheeks suck into my feet. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so what you did is uh, you went up to rows. Yep, and I'll, I'll show that again. So rows, rows. row selection, selection, and select dominant. And, and I can pick okay. any number of continuous factors to choose. Huh. So you can actually do that for um, process, for yield, and you can look at um, what's happening with yield, uh, low yield, high yield, right? Yeah, I, I think – Buying a spaceship's way more entertaining, but that oh, might yeah. be more more practical. You're right. Well, I and um, and then uh, I was playing around with short term, long term stocks because of you know I might want to buy a spaceship too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks like uh, they, they, this is a good market for spaceships. You know. Oh, cool. That stimulus well, check. <laughs> well, you better practice with that lightsaber. You better take some lessons from your daughter. Well, thanks, Pete. That was pretty neat. I'll have to make a note of that in my little tips and tricks journal that uh, we've been doing. Yeah, absolutely. And this has been your jump tip of the day for May the 4th. Thank you so much, Pete and Mary. You know, Pete, actually, I also have my own lightsaber, and I get to play with it all on my own. Okay, maybe not completely on my own. So thank you so much, Pete and Mary. Uh, we're really glad to have you on our May the 4th edition of the Tip of the Day. Now, if you joined us and you enjoyed these shows, we really hope that you'll check out our segment page, community.jump.com slash jump on air. We hope you follow us on all our different social media channels. Uh, we have a lot to share and we share often. Do check out the program guide. We will continue to have great programming this week. And so we hope you'll join us on Wednesday and Friday. And we hope you share us with your colleagues. Jump.com slash JOA is the link to share. Until then, until Wednesday, we hope you stay safe. We hope you stay healthy. We hope you stay close. Uh, even if you're keeping your distance. And I wish you a very happy May the 4th. Take care, everyone.